I guess it's over to me. Uh, I'm delighted <clears throat> to have my old friend Ruben Nelson, and who's currently one of the directors of, of KCOR, to talk to us about what's happening in Alberta. I'm, I'm a British Columbian, and I'm from the West, and we always used to look over the, the mountains and say, well, Alberta, it's different. <laughs> in fact, well, coming from the other the other part of the, that coast, we didn't really pay any attention to anything that happened east of the Rockies. But uh, that said, Alberta has become increasingly important as the fulcrum of energy development in Canada. And Ruben, I've known for a long, long time, doing future stuff in government, even working for government in talking in futures and forecasting. And he has been one of the people trying to get people to look ahead. But he has a large challenge now trying to get people to look ahead in what many Canadians think is the most backward province in terms of energy futures. That said, I'm going to throw the challenge over to Ruben, and hopefully we can all query him on how can he make them change their minds. Ruben, over to you. Thank you, Ted. Uh, that's a marvelous way to get started. So I want to thank everybody on this call. I look forward to engaging with you later. And I particularly want to thank KCOR for this series. Uh, it was a wonderful invention and in response to COVID and has become the most significant weekly webinar of which I know. And I'm delighted to be part of it. So what can we make of Alberta and the Alberta election? Implications for Canada. This disclaimer simply says, anything I say about any of the actors involved is my impression of them, my understanding of them. <laughs> I, don't, I know none of them well enough to know what they really are. So there's no suggestion that this is what they really are. It's rather my experience. I'm speaking out of that. Of course, I was born and raised in Alberta. And therefore, in that sense, I am an Albertan. I've also had the advantage of living outside Alberta for about a third of my life and even outside Canada and Western culture. And so uh, bring those experiences uh, to this. The structure of the presentation is the view I've come to. Uh, I want to think with you just a bit about the election and its results. Then I want to think about several of the conditions which have enabled the election result and the present situation that we're in, which I deem to be far more dangerous than most people either in or outside of Alberta understand. And we'll then make some concluding observations. So the view I've come to, this is a slide I used December 16th, 2020, uh, when I spoke on this series about uh, the first warning to folks in KCOR uh, about uh, what's going on in Alberta and why it mattered to the rest of Canada. And as you can see that I suggested that there were storms coming from Alberta, which in meteorological terms are called Alberta clippers in the winter. And they settle in Southern Ontario and Quebec. Um, and so be prepared for attacks on Canada, our history and constitution and character while dressed up as a rational debate, it's highly emotional and manipulative. It's rooted in just enough facts to be credible and be aware of the paranoia, conspiracy theories and covert power plays. And also be aware that our times, which are volatile, uncertain, complex and ambiguous, make this possible in a way that the kinds of things that are now happening here could not have happened in the 1950s or even the 1970s. They are possible in the 2020s. That's to update this, that there are major disruptions ahead, more Alberta Clippers coming. In my view, I fear that it will be the most dangerous time for Canada since the 1980s and early 1990s. And those of you old enough will remember that's the time of the two Quebec referendums, of the peak of uh, the demands of the sovereignists in, in Quebec for uh, independence. And we almost lost the country it was just by a hair that the second referendum was defeated, as well as a couple of hairballed attempts by Mulroney to um, make a difference. 
So the Alberta election, May 29th, all, so it's almost a month ago. There were 14 um, political parties. Now, the thing that's interesting is very few Albertans know that there were 14 political parties because there was no writing in the province that all 14 parties actually had a candidate. And there were some parties, some constituencies for only the two main parties, the NDP and the UCP, that's New Democratic Party and the United uh, Conservative Party uh, had candidates. And in most of them, there were those two candidates and then a smattering of others. Uh, we had a Green Party candidate and someone from the Solidarity Movement of Alberta, which all of us said, what the heck is that? We'd never heard of it before. The ones with the yellow beside them are parties on the right or extreme right. <clears throat> so the results. You can see the map on the left, the orange bits are the NDP, and you can see that it, they exist if you know the map of Alberta, that the, the, the little cluster of yellow dots uh, that's in the center of the province is Edmonton, the yellow dots that are to the right of that big uh, orange thing is Calgary. There's one little orange dot down in Lethbridge, and then there's that big piece of orange, which is uh, Banff Kananaskis, which is my writing. So it's considered a rural riding, which is the one rural riding that the NDP won. It's actually the richest and best educated riding in Canada. And so by those standards should be treated as a rural, as an urban riding. So that there's a sense in which Alberta now reflects that urban rural split that uh, in many places is being uh, talked about. The turnout was 8% less, which means that by one calculation, 113,000 people who had voted for the UCP in 2019 stayed home because they couldn't bring themselves to vote for Danielle Smith, but nor could they bring themselves to hold their nose and vote for Rachel. And if only 1,400 of them in six particular ridings had have shown up, uh, the outcome would have been different. Uh, Rachel would be the premier now. And you can see with the bottom circled bit that. Um, the, the vote for alternative parties simply collapsed. It used to be almost 11%. In this election, it was 3.4. So that uh, people were clear that uh, stopping Danielle from being premier was more important to them uh, than voting their first preference. Uh, these are just simply the maps of Edmonton on the left, Calgary on the right, Lethbridge West in the middle. Uh, the only places other than Banff Kananaskis that the NDP held seats. So let's just look quickly at the election campaign. The, the critical features of the UCP campaign are here. Um, the most interesting thing is this is the first time in Alberta history where a, a defeated premier had not retired and had therefore become leader of the opposition and stayed around to lead the party in the next, so that Rachel had a record to defend when she was premier from 2019 to 2000, 2015 to 19. And that was a period, you may remember the price of oil fell off a cliff in 2014, did not rise again till 2021. And so the UCP were able to trot out just armloads and truckloads of data that the economy went really south the last time the NDP governed us. And of course, there was no hint that this was under conditions that would have happened if a UCP government had governed us as well, because the price of oil isn't set in Canada. Uh, but of course, this is politics today and um, dishonesty, that kind of dishonesty is um, just taken for granted. Um, they also kept the premier under wraps. Um, uh, there were just many, many days when the premier was not available to the press, did not show up for, for a, a, a campaign rally of any kind. She didn't do a campaign rally the last weekend of a campaign, and that's almost unheard of. This is the time you get your people out. Um, they had a better ad agency, and Danielle Smith presents herself well, and this is a significant feature that I grew up in a culture where people made a clear distinction between character and personality. We now live in a culture that is intellectually lazy. We can't even tell the difference between fewer and less. 
And so the distinction between personality and character is also a distinction most people can't make. And therefore, what happened is if you're with her, Danielle Smith has an extraordinary, is an extraordinary attractive person in her personality. She's fun to be with. Uh, she's clear. She presents herself well. It's her character that makes her unfit to govern. But if you don't make that distinction, and so there are lots of letters to the editor saying, I've just been spent some time with her. She's not at all what the, some people make her out to be. And so I'm going to vote for her. <clears throat> the NDP campaign, uh, Rachel, from my point of view, strangely, uh, but what do I know about politics, um, did not address, defend, or explain her record at all. They were silent about it. But it then meant that the UCP had the field to themselves to create this impression that she had failed in what to Albertans is the most important single thing, namely the economy. And she made no attempt to say any government during that period would have faced these difficulties and had much the same record. In fact, conceivably a worse record. Um, they failed to make Daniel Smith the main issue because they too couldn't distinguish between personality and character. Uh, they made no serious attempt to reach out to uh, old progressives of the old PC type. And as noted, 113,000 of them stayed home, which is way more than would have been needed for the NDP to win this. That's been true from the time they were elected in 2015 to today. And uh, these are arguments I've had uh, with many in the NDP, including briefly with the premier. Uh, but no traction there. And Rachel presents herself always as a politician. And you get a sense from the NDP that everything's political and they run it through a political filter. And of course, in today's environment, there's a resentment to people who politicize everything. And she doesn't present herself as if there's a real person there with a moral core who then guides her politics. She just isn't able to do that, project that from a platform. Big difference. And in both cases, hard issues were avoided. Uh, nothing from either one of them on climate change or a sales tax for Alberta, which are the two things that will define Alberta uh, over the next decade. Northrop Fry pointed out it matters when you're cast into history because the conditions of those times will define you. So we need to understand when was Alberta cast into history? Well, the first European didn't set foot, that's Anthony Hendy, didn't set foot in what is now Alberta until 1754. Well, by 1754, the modern techno-industrial world, its, in, its intellectual foundations are all shaped. Much of the technology that will define it, the printing press is 300 years old, the Reformation has happened, the Royal Society is almost 100 years old. Um, so, uh, and it was 130 years later that Europeans didn't begin to come in any numbers. So Alberta is a very late entrant into the modern world, which meant that from the beginning, it could have the benefits of late modernity and um, didn't have to try out stuff that was 16th and 17th century and then learn to improve it. So this is a great gift. And I seem to be the only person in Alberta who talks about this openly and publicly. I've never seen an article or heard anybody else say, of course, given the richness of this land and given when we entered, it would have been almost impossible to fail, which of course, by modern standards, we haven't. So it's important to understand that Albertans are among the newly rich. And what we know about the newly rich is they're hungry to be seen, heard, respected, and counted, to be accepted as one of the big boys. In other words, there's psychological uncertainty in newly rich people where established rich people, if you live in Kingston, as I did for 10 years, you can't tell by walking around Kingston where the old money is. And the old money just smiles and says, that's why we're old money, uh, because they don't flaunt it. So I want to think with you as well about the smoldering resentments that got laid down from the time Alberta was formed as a province carved out of the Northwest Territories in 1905. And Alberta is the only other province like Quebec in which the not all the elites, 
but at least a critical mass of the elites in the province think they have not just a vested interest, but a duty to get to teach new people in Quebec, in the one case, Alberta, on the other hand, to be angry and resentful. Now, I don't know about you, but raising angry and resentful children doesn't seem to be the goal of good parenting. So here's a, a cartoon that I forget the paper it was in uh, shortly after Jason Kenney had been elected. Uh, but the theme is stop treating us unfairly. And the bits in blue are some of the ways, some of the stories that get told within Alberta and two new Albertans that if they're real Albertans, they will feel as if these things happen to them. And so, uh, I mean, this is, of course, psychologically unhealthy um, uh, and even damaging. And here in red are then more recent things. And if you've been paying attention recently, uh, the stuff in red will be more familiar to you than the, the things in blue. Uh, but I point out that the Laurentian elites down in the bottom right hand corner is not a well established category in Canadian history. This is a category invented only about 15 years ago by a columnist who is outside Alberta but sympathetic to Alberta and so invented this so that we could have, we could identify who we should hate in Ontario and Quebec and it's not everybody, it's just their elites and because of the Laurentian mountains defining that part of the world, uh, the Laurentian elites are get used as if it's a legitimate category to think about ca Canadian history. And of course, rep by pop is an American phrase, but you need to know that the people, many of the people behind this are the old Calgary school, who for 35 years have been trying to Americanize Alberta politics. This came across my desk just yesterday. It's just an example. The last sentence is now typed in red. The system is rigged against the West after all. And it's said just factually. And it's accepted by, if you, if you divide Alberta up into chunks of people, it's not yet a majority, but it is a plurality. The largest group of Albertans who think about these things agree that Alberta has been abused and um, the system is rigged against it and we should be angry. So how has Alberta developed in spite of this? Well, of course, in spite of being oppressed and whatnot, uh, given the richness of the land and when we arrived by modern standards. And you've got to remember that modern standards privilege money rather than everything else. And you know, people, uh, I admire people who talk about human well-being and are committed to it, uh, but we all know that there's uh, a half a trillion dollar advertising industry that is designed to hook you on modern measures for success and uh, money is the key. It is now on the high altar of modern culture. And so it's legitimate to see Alberta as not just a petro state, but to see it as culture trapped, that it's trapped within modernity with very little energy to do anything other than improve modernity. Now, some want to improve it more to the left, others to the right, but all 14 of those parties from the communists on all work within a modern frame of reference. And as long as you do, in my view, uh, human well being will never be at the center. The modernity is thick enough and still powerful enough uh, that it can absorb any of the shocks we send it to be more decent. And it's also the case that since Peter Lougheed, no premier has ever made it a feature of being premier to demand and ask Albertans to actually be the owners of Alberta psychologically and act like an owner, which is a Peter Lougheed phrase. He used it often, he addressed us as citizens, he had citizens have responsibilities, and he talked a lot about that. Uh, Don Getty did not. He inherited a more difficult situation and was overwhelmed by it and finally left. Peter Lougheed, at least not Ralph Klein, never on no occasion as whether running for the leadership of the PC party or as premier ever addressed Albertans as citizens. He talked to us as shareholders or stakeholders and that we should measure the success of his government by cash in our pocket. 
Um, and so it's become part of uh, Alberta's identity that we have the lowest taxes and, and that somehow this is virtuous on our part, uh, rather than a historical accident that we've just taken advantage of. So the predominant flavor of a critical mass of Alberta elites. So I'm talking here the kinds of people who have easy access to op-ed pages, uh, who if they write a letter to the editor, it tends to get published, who get invited to speak to rotary clubs in the chambers of commerce and other kinds of events. So these are people with voice and influence. And they're absolutely committed to a, a form of cowboy capitalism, free range capitalism. The story they tell themselves is that's what built the West. I mean, don't accept this stuff as true, but this is the story. We all need stories to get through the night. I do as well. It's just that you should actually care as a decent and educated person that the stories you tell yourself have some relationship to reality. These folks are hostile to people they see as getting in the way and not letting us rightly make as much money by running our economy the way we want to run it. And therefore, they measure their resentment by cash, and there'll be more of that. They also look at foreign investments. I mean, of course, the oil and gas industry is entirely about foreign investments. Petro-Canada, which we see as a Canadian, passes itself off as a Canadian company, uh, is owned primarily by Americans. Um, and, but the government, Kenny, talked about foreign money funding environmentalists who wanted to shut down the oil patch, and they were attack on Alberta's character and on our economy. And, and this is extraordinarily ironic because this is the premier of Alberta who runs a petro state that is basically does what the, patrol, the big boys in the petroleum in, industry want, all of whom who have spent time in either Oklahoma City or Houston uh, because the truck and trade across the border in the oil company and never in their life would they think of Americans as foreigners, except when it's convenient to talk about foreign money corrupting our environmentalists. Um, and we'll, we'll come back to that. And so they're resentful about all the money we send to Ottawa and the fact that Ottawa doesn't pay any attention to us, that, that we don't have as much influence as the money. And if you think about that, that's an attitude of a male that's about 17 and not all that well bred. Um, so Albertans have been worked into a major snit. This is not something that we have done spontaneously. This is something we have been taught by our elites, including tenured faculty, politicians, CEOs and others. Uh, so we are about to become the next Quebec in Canada, threatening to go alone if need be. And remember that the right is organized and institutionally in a way that progressives in Alberta are not. So here's Jason Kenney, uh, just a few months after he was elected premier. He had spent two and a half years before this barnstorming the province. He came from Ottawa, bought a big blue truck, barnstormed the province to, to create, to talk two political parties then in becoming the United Conservative Party so they weren't splitting the vote on the right. He then spent a year uh, working to become leader of the UCP and then into an election campaign. So he had two and a half years in which he did nothing other than barnstorm the province to say to Albertans that we've been treated unfairly and we should be in a snit. And it worked. And so he said in 2019, in the past year, I've heard more expressions of support for Western Alberta separatism than I've heard in my whole life. It's a reflection on deep frustration of the people who think we help the Federation pay the bills, we played by the rules, we haven't complained about it, and yet we get royally screwed. The hypocrisy of this country at driving a level of alienation I haven't seen in my whole life. People are angry and they should be. Now, what's important about this is one is you've got the premier of the province agreeing with the anger and, of course, being the main person who has been stirring it up for two and a half years so that this isn't just independent people. This is the government as a government telling its people that, um, uh, that they have been mistreated 
And, and so this, this then has all kinds of dangers in it psychologically that would not be the case if this were being led by some voluntary organization. It's also the case that you have embedded in this that same adolescent sense that because we've paid the bills and been decent, which of course any well-bred human being should do, uh, that somehow because we've put up so much money, we should be listened to. It's that adolescent view that is not recognized. So there's no reflexivity in this. There's no impulse for either self-control or reflexivity, which is dangerous. So you've got perfect conditions for same shameless, power-hungry leaders who work hungry folks into a lather, tell them it's justified, and pass themselves off as Alberta's Moses, who, remember, said to Israel in Egypt, just give me your life, because you have to do that. If you're coming with me into the wilderness, you have to trust that, in fact, you won't just die there. So give me your life, and I will lead you out of bondage. But of course, that's the promise that every fascist leader makes, as well as every genuine leader makes, who is leading oppressed people out of bondage. And the question in Alberta is seldom raised as to, are these people trustworthy? So assertion you're going to see from me several times is now is not the time to be sowing seeds of distrust and incoherence, which our governments and our uh, many of our elites are doing. So now I want to talk to you about a condition of today in the 2020s that our populist leaders don't see, not seen by Pierre Polyev or by anybody in Alberta or by folks in the US. And that is the foundations of our modern techno-industrial cultures are shifting. So here's the logo of Prudential Life Insurance. It goes back to the early part of the 20th century at a time when we thought the truth did not change, that it was forever. And if you had the truth, it was a rock, like the Rock of Gibraltar, which is the logo of Prudential. And if you remember their old radio slogans, they used to talk about Prudential, the rock. Except we now know that even rocks erode, move, become unstable if the timeline's long enough. You got 200 million years, the Rocky Mountains I live in aren't here. Rather, my little cabin in Lactus Ark would be underwater in uh, an ocean we would now kind of think of as the, the Pacific Ocean of the day. So we live in a world where the, domin the culture that dominates the world is itself in the process of disintegrating. And the worst thing that can happen is to have leaders of governments not understand this enough so that they trample all over the place as if the turmoil they create, as if the culture is stable enough and nothing bad will happen that they can't control. And of course, social realities are social constructions and far less stable than rock. You can't just create them in a weekend. Yes, they're measured in decades and even generations, and centuries, but only that. They're, they're not measured even in millennia. Um, and so here's a little graph I use. Don't worry about the numbers on the left-hand axis. What's important is just the ratio of the blue to the orange line. The blue line is these are the challenges faced by people and institutions in broadly the 50s and 60s, whether you're talking churches, universities, corporations, governments, whatever. And by and large, it was the case from labor unions right through the whole set that the leadership had more developed characteristics than the challenges they faced. And by and large, their institutions worked and confidence in those institutions and trust of the leaders worked. There was deference. By the 1990s, those two things had kind of evened out and some institutions we're losing some credibility because they had unfortunate leaders. Others had more fortunate leaders who were still ahead of the game, but lots of places were scrambling just to keep up. And today I know of no significant institution in Canada, uh, none from the Supreme Court down, no university, no government department, no national church, uh, no national voluntary organization where the leadership routinely is more able than the challenges they face. What I know are good people 
who are increasingly exhausted and saying in moments of honesty that they feel they cannot say publicly, there are days and whole weeks I have no idea what the hell is going on. And therefore, yes, we have a strategic plan, but even I don't have confidence in it. Now is not the time to be sowing seeds of distrust and incoherence. So now let's come to Alberta's liberation story, which can only be told in these conditions. It could not have been told, even though some of the conditions I've told you would be the same in 1950. It could not have been told even in 1970. It can be told today. And it's interesting that it has exactly the same elements as a genuine story of liberation. That is, there are people who have been oppressed. We think of black, indigenous, and people of color. We think of women. There are all kinds of folks. We think of folks who have been handicapped and ignored. There's lots of people in our culture who, to small or large degrees, some of them systematically, have been oppressed. And the logic that's set out here is a logic that they need because otherwise they'll wait Cinderella like in the ashes for Prince Charming to save them. And whatever else the women's movement has done for all of us is if you're waiting for a Prince Charming to change your life, give it up folks, not gonna happen. And so Alberta's story is that we've been colonized by the Eastern bastards to use Ralph Pine's phrase. We are virtuous victims. We, the richest and, and most gifted people in Canada, have, are, are victims of all these other Canadians. They neither see us nor respect us. Nothing will change. They're beyond redemption. We must free ourselves, fight back, become masters in our own house. The evidence is overwhelming. The law is on our side. We have a right to develop our country and society as we see fit. We all love Canada as much as they do. But if you love Alberta and are a real Albertan, you will join us. And so you see here the same kind of insidious and quite sick sense that old stock Quebecers have. That yes, you can come here and join Quebec and you have to speak French and all that, but you'll never be as real a Quebecer as we who descended from original Quebecers. And that attitude is now growing in Alberta. We'll let you come from anywhere. You're welcome, even if you're a new arrival after 20 minutes. But the fact is, if you don't develop the resentments and the anger that are appropriate for Albertans, it's not clear that you'll be accepted as a real Albertan. And that thread, as I say, is psychologically sick as well as dishonest. And so here is our past premier and our present premier and some of the stuff that, um, that, that we're up against, including the government of Alberta. So here's the government of Alberta selling the line that foreigners are corrupting, uh, are out to shut down our oil industry. Uh, and so Premier Kenny uh, set up a royal commission, uh, three and a half million dollars over two years to identify the money from the US that's corrupting uh, Alberta. And of course, the report, they, they did not hold only Royal Commission, probably in Canada's history, but certainly in only Royal Commission in Alberta's history, did not hold one public hearing. This was entirely done by secretive uh, research. And if you look at the folks the contracts were given to, these are people who have already swallowed the swill. And, but, but the guy who headed it had just enough integrity to say, I'm sorry, Premier, uh, your main assertion that foreign money is corrupting our environmental groups and they want to shut down the oil patch simply isn't true. The sad thing is he and the folks around him still talk as if it is true when they're talking privately. Here is the government of Alberta again, created the Canadian Energy Center. It sounds like a perfectly legitimate thing. It shows that the people in energy, they're using energy generically, uh, so that the folks in Quebec might be working for Hydro-Quebec, if you didn't know any better. This is a Canadian corporation incorporated in Alberta, done in such a way, funded entirely and owned by the government of Alberta, but done in a way it's not responsible to the, to the legislature of Alberta. It's only legislate, responsible to the premier. And energy they're talking about here is oil and gas, and they're trying to create the sense that oil and gas is good for the whole country. And when we work, Canada works. Um, 
which is the analog of Bill Davis's old slogan that was up on billboards, uh, keep Ontario working uh, by Canadian. And Bill Davis had the decency when it was pointed out that that assumed that all the heavy manufacturing was done in Ontario, which it was at the time, uh, and that was offense to other Canadians, he took the billboards down. Uh, we have no such decency. <laughs> this is uh, a thing that you may have seen if you traveled in airports in Canada in the 2020s and 2021. Um, we spent money, government money again, to put up signs. This is supposedly to tell Canadians how rotten the federal government is to de be delaying the, the Trans Mountain Pipeline. And it's costing not just Albertans, but Canadians $80 million a day. And if you count it from August 30th to about September, I think I took this in 2020, uh, it's $10 billion that, that we have lost as if it's real money. Uh, here's Alberta Fairness, whose job is to educate Canadians regarding public policy that are unfair and chronically damaging to Alberta's interests and highlight the contributions Alberta's made to Canada, which again, folks, are entirely in cash. And so since the year 2000, the way they calculated, Alberta spent $325 billion to ship to Ottawa more than we get back from Ottawa, as if a, a country is the kind of commercial gain that for every dollar you invest, you get at least a dollar back. This from the National Post. You can tell in a glance that only Ontario, Alberta, and BC contribute to Canada. Everybody else is a free rider, and Quebec is the worst of the lot, which maps on to the story uh, that uh, Alberta is selling to itself and the world. And of course, other people then join in and uh, this was just a group of citizens who put up enough money to put up a billboard. But again, with that same kind of, of anger to it, uh, the Wild Rose Party, the fifth note down on the left-hand side, the induced recession, which has devastated Alberta. Now let's just stop right there. There was a recession in Alberta from 2014 to 2021. It did not happen in the same way of the rest of Canada. Albertans got really annoyed because when recessions happen in most parts of Canada, the federal government and other Canadians pay attention to it because that's doing damage in a way that is so obvious that they can't fund their way out of it. Well, the fact is, even in that recession, Alberta has enough cash resources and uh, taxes that it does not inflict, such as a sales tax, that we could have dealt with that had we wanted to. But this is a, a barefaced lie, as if the international price of oil is set by Justin Trudeau in Ottawa. Well, actually, it was the 2014, which is the last of the Harper government. I mean, it, it's just so that the standards of ethics and decency that we kind of take for granted, we still take for granted. My warning is this is being eroded far more deeply than we know. This is the Buffalo Declaration. The third point down, Alberta is physically and structurally isolated from economic and political power structures. Now that kind of implies that when Alberta was carved out of the Northwest Territories, that the federal government had the opportunity to place Alberta maybe where Thunder Bay is, so we would be physically closer to economic and political power structures. I mean, this is nuts, folks. And to be structurally isolated is simply that we're not even as bright as Quebec is. Quebec at least understands that the Liberal Party is the natural governing party, or even when the Conservatives, they elect a few people, which by definition, half, some of them have to be in the cabinet because it's so important to the government in power. So that these were five progressive conservative MPs from Alberta and Saskatchewan who wrote this stuff. This is again, people on the public payroll who don't know any better and who claim that they should be governing us. Jack Mintz, who was the senior economist at C.D. Howe and had a national reputation as uh, somebody who knows about corporation tax, probably knows more about it than any other Canadian. Um, 
This is at a conference in January 2020, 200 people in the Calgary Convention Center. I'm one of them. Most of them are people who believe this well because I wanted to hear the message for myself, see who was there, talk, because a lot of them are friends and acquaintances I know, and get a sense of why do you believe this stuff? And so this is Jack saying the West wants in, that's the Reform Party, didn't work. And so if they don't shape up this time, we got a time for plan B. And this, the, the, this is from an article uh, by Ted Morton, who's one of the Calgary School, uh, Screwing the West to Pay the Rest, written in 2018. Uh, the ATM figure of 544 should be per second rather than minute. It's just a, an error on the slide. You can do the math yourself. Uh, but this is the story is that since 61, six, over $600 billion has been sent to Ottawa from which we have not received any value at all. And here's Jack, Ted Martin, and Tom Flanagan, the last two. These are all tenured professors at U of C uh, who, in a sense, should know, who's, who's just academic standards of integrity should not let them write this stuff. But I agree with them that Alberta is at a crossroads. It's a situation in Canadian Confederation is unfair, it's unequal. I don't believe that. I mean, I believe there are things to fix, but, but the way they tell it, um, so now is not the time to be sowing seeds of distrust and incoherence. So some observations. This is just saying, that I'm still wrestling with the, the story that I'm telling you. I'm a perfectly normal Albertan male. I know these people to come to terms with the fact that there is a rot in our province that is deeper than meets the eye. And this isn't just normal politics, but remember how long it took Americans, not just the Democratic Party, but how long it took Americans, including the American press and the media, to understand that Donald Trump wasn't just a normal politician with a little bit of a twist, which is the way that Pierre Polyev presents himself, that, that Danielle Smith presents herself, as opposed to someone who, in fact, is actually quite dangerous and corrupting us. And so uh, this is just saying that I'm still working my way through this. So these can be treated as tentative conclusions, but I have thought long and hard about these. This is not a casual conversation. The UCP is not as advertised. It's not a normal conservative government or movement. Ken Busenkall, who deeply, I mean, knows all these people, uh, deeply involved with the Reform Party at Ottawa, uh, I know Ken, he is a very decent person. I would trust him with my life. Um, Ken wrote a lovely article making this case. And so I'm not, I, I agree with him, uh, although I have some other reasons as well as the ones he articulated. They're better understood as an alt-right elite led and funded group who have longed for Alberta to become a permanent bastion in Canada of neoclassical economics and personal freedom which is why you see libertarianism and the Chicago School wed together. And the watchword is ordered freedom, which is a phrase they picked up from the US. And I'll come back to that. They're dangerous because they're hardening hearts and coarsening minds, that they are making legitimate a story of liberation that has no, that has limited grounding in fact. You have to really stretch the facts to be as angry and determined and extreme as they are. And, um, but they have an interest as, as, as saviors of ground down people always do, they have an interest in saying, as, as Trump did, you may not remember, the thing that sent chills down my spine is at the Republican convention when Trump won the nomination in 2016, is he said, I am your voice. And when you get leaders who in that sense see in themselves the incarnation of the whole people, you know you're into fascism. And 
So, and it's easy to do. The people who by and large follow them have been ignored and neglected. There is a case that they can make that they have not been treated well. I'll come back to that. So you can expect psychological and even physical violence to increase as of today. We have no sound idea how much further down we'll sink as a liberal democratic society. We simply don't know where bottom is. This is a quote from an American friend of mine who used to teach in American university. He quit. He had taught a course in understanding media for 20 to 30 years and basically said this about the students who now come to university they're supposedly university students, but they come with this post-truth attitude that they're unwilling to be taught. And he said, I can't convince them. I can't teach them. What's more, it's gotten to the point that I can't bear them. I no longer want to be in the same space with them because they no longer in any important sense are open enough that they want to learn anything that I have the skills to teach. And so I quit. That's what's happening in our country. It's happening still enough at the edges that folks aren't alarmed. And my sense is, my fear is that the tide is coming in and it will need to come in a good deal before we're smart enough to understand that they're doing serious damage. The UCP is led by a person who is headstrong and who legitimize others to be headstrong. And this is a time a headstrong is almost certainly to be wrongheaded. You cannot low bridge Danielle Smith for four years. That's not her personality. She's woefully ignorant of even the basics of our form of government where she shows no interest in learning. There are real cases behind that. If you wanna know about any of this stuff, we can talk about it later. They appear to have an adolescent view of what it is to quote, hold power. Why can't I do everything that I promised to do? I'm the premier. The ordered freedom of the alt-right will not sit well with most Albertans once they understand what it implies. That because the alt-right has a static and fixed understanding of truth, which is perfectly understandable for modernity, but because they're holding on to that, then when they are right about important things, if you disagree with them, you're not just a different view, an opponent, you're an enemy. And they treat people as enemies, like enemies. So um, you get dealt with as such. So the table is set for civil war. And just before I move to civil war, just think about the public service in Alberta. If what I'm even if what I'm saying has 30% truth in it, discount it by 70%. What's likely to happen to the public service? given that these people have no respect for tradition, they don't even understand the traditions they're supposed to respect, let alone the laws. They think that public servants are employees of the government in power and that the public service vow that public servants take to Her Majesty is in fact a vow to be obedient to the government in power. Danielle Smith in her first week of premier tried to talk the clerk of executive council, that's her own deputy minister, into appointing five hacks of the UCP to be deputy ministers and didn't understand why she couldn't do it. This means we're in a situation that is how, whatever the dynamics are, four years from now when the next government, whether the UCP is reelected again or somebody else, they will inherit a public service that is in noticeably worse shape than the public service now. And this is on top of the fact that for 40 years, the business community has been saying to the best and brightest in universities that public service is not an honorable calling, that the honorable calling is to go out and make as much money as you can. So the quality of the public service today, quite apart from Danielle Smith, is worse than it was when I was in Ottawa in the early Trudeau years. It will be in tatters, and this will affect every institution because they will be trying to run the province as if they own it. And so the Civil War script is this. Alberta wants to play the role of the South that the South played in the American Civil War. The word is think social and economic order. So what if we have a different way to organize our economy and our society? We're still Canadians in love with this country as much as you do. 
Just respect us and our differences and all will be well. Besides, we have a constitutional right to organize our government and manage our natural resources. That's in section 93. Stay in your own lane, a direct quote from the premier. She uses it often. You allow even enable Quebec to be different. Why not Alberta? Why does multiculturalism not extend to Alberta as a, a culture? And besides, we're big enough to cause you serious trouble, so don't tangle with us. And so as with the Quebec case, the locals have been stirred up. Everybody knows that Albertans are alienated from Canada. If you talk to talking heads across Canada, that's so much taken for granted. What's more, it's taken as legitimate. I mean, so that this story has now been sold well enough that other elites in Canada treat this as if this is factual and justified. The press have taken it for granted and often now reinforce it. Jason Kenney led the We Need a Fair Deal chorus for two and a half years and was elected. He then had a fair deal panel that had hearings and wrote a report. So people point to, well, look at the fair deal panel. It said all these things until you realize looking from the inside that it's a put up job. It's absolutely phony. And I say that because I know, know uh, deeply several of the people on the panel who lost their integrity. Um, consider that the referendum removing equalization was passed in 1921. The NDP did not say a word about that, as if the NDP cared no more about Canada than the UCP. And so the UCP was reelected in with the Sovereignty Act. So it looks as if, in a sense, the people in Alberta are with them. But unlike the Quebec case, the governing party federally has no vested interest in Alberta. And what's more, they have no deep knowledge of Alberta. Whereas the Liberal Party of Canada has been a critical player in Quebec, time immemorial, federally, and more recently, provincially, they have vested interest in Quebec. They're in every community. They, they know stuff on the ground. This means that the Liberal Party is willing to organize themselves and other people to fight for Quebec staying in Canada. There's nobody in Alberta to do that. Albertans have no vested interest in the Liberal Party of Canada. There's no organized groups in Alberta to defend Alberta and Canada. The only organized folks are on the right and the alt-right. There's no Mike Pearson who took prophylactic action in relationship to Quebec with the B&B &B Commission. Without that, we probably would have lost the country. Most Canadians don't understand that. Many elites in the rest of Canada defend Alberta and Aegis on. So in the face of it, Alberta's case is absurd to most Canadians. How can the richest part of Canada hands down be oppressed? How can we be so self-centered? They are not a people, we are in Alberta, are not a people conquered by war. Other Canadians say to us, they don't speak a separate language. They're just another damn province. They'll get no sympathy from me. Polling done by Alberta's best pollster, done nationally, just recently, about 18 months ago, turned up the fact that 50% of Canadians are reluctant to even consider a move to Alberta to a better job. Alberta is not holding a sovereignty referendum. Rather, it will do what Quebec is now doing, achieving sovereignty association by stealth. And there appears to be no Lincoln in the wings to draw on the American case. So this is going to get difficult. My point here is simply the folks that are being taken advantage of, the, the, the sheep that the UCP are collecting and all these other groups that are stirring up. These are often people who actually have a case that they have been neglected by those of us who are part of a well-educated and cosmopolitan modern world. And they have been hungry. They, they are set up in difficult times to respond to somebody who cares for them. And they see the, the fact that the only folks standing up for them are now people we see as extremists, as not just uncaring on our part, but as cruel. Because they wanna take back the life that has been taken from them. They don't understand what happened to a world that in some cases, if they're old enough, it's their childhood. In other cases, the childhood of their parents or their grandparents, but they know there was a world and a, a long a period longer than a generation when the Canada society got fairer, 
that a, a single income could provide for a family, that houses were affordable, that basically democracy worked. And for the last 50 years, that's been disappearing. So if we're gonna play, we have to acknowledge that progressive minded people and communities have no effective organizations in Canada that are staffed and funded like the Manning Center, which is now Canada Strong and Free or the Fraser Institute. We have no database of the people who care enough to sign up. We can't listen to them, call upon them or call them to action. If this situation continues, we may lose the game before we realize there's a game to be played. And we have to learn to talk again to the people that the Pierre Polyevs and Daniel Smiths are talking to. Remember, and I say this respectfully of the Club of Rome and encouraging you now around human well being, but the Club of Rome mostly has been an example of modern techno industrial cosmopolitanism, which has been focused on an abstract sense of persons and looked at economic and technical structures. So there was nothing in the original Club of Rome about real human persons <laughs> and communities. And that's what the UCP is appealing to. And if we can't compete with them, then we're in trouble. So we have to reintegrate these people into our work because our credibility hangs on it. And only so will our voice ring true even to ourselves, let alone us. So as a final thought to chew on, Canada is wounded by Alberta. This serves none of us well. If a wounded Canada, a wounded Canada, will we have little to offer an increasingly troubled world. Over to you. The future is in our hands, minds, hearts, and spirits. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ruben. Uh... It's not what we really want to hear, but uh, <laughs> the facts never hurt. Uh, I'm going to challenge you at the end to talk about solutions and leave us at least with one happy thought that we might be able to create Canadian well-being. Uh, I get the first question, and then we'll go pretty well in order the ones people have asked, because they do logically flow. Um, I told you earlier, I'm a British Columbian, and we always used to ignore everything happening the other side of the Rockies. And we used to wake up in the morning and not give a damn what happened in the rest of Canada. But we always got the feeling that you guys woke up every morning viciously harmed by the rest of the country and uh, spending all your time looking at what Ontario or Quebec thought of you. Uh, the problem, and, and Alberta is not the only place like that in the world, there are others, where every morning they wake up to have, have something to be mad about, a point which you made very well. Uh, but uh, the real question is, is this a global phenomenon? Is everybody looking for someone else to blame for their troubles? Is anybody prepared to accept accountability and uh, try and take uh, steps that will make it better? The, the, the short answer is your worst fears, uh, I would confirm your worst fears. It's one of the things that worries me about Alberta is that we are at a moment in history, quite apart from Alberta, that, that uh, the foundations of our modern world are no longer convincing even to ourselves when we look at them carefully, let alone to other people. And most people aren't well-educated enough to have this, uh, this is not to despise them, but they have an intuition that their world isn't working and they trust it less. And so the demise of deference, the lack of trust in authority, which to some extent is needed, at least to minimal degree, to, to learn to cope with the situation. Because if it is a global situation, we're not going to be able to cope with it if it just breaks up into warring gangs. And so you know that, and I know that, Ted. Mm -hmm. and in that sense, Alberta is no worse than other places. What makes it worse is, as you point out, uh, there, there's something about Alberta that in one sense gets inflated as pride that we're so special. We, we've always wanted to be leaders and to be seen as, as punching above our weight um, rather than earning it the old fashioned way. 
and and that kind of adolescence um, is uh, we don't we have no leaders in Alberta who will speak publicly who challenge us to outgrow our adolescence and that that's required if we're going to cope with this. So if you want a word of hope, it's in a statement my son made to me when he was 12, when he said to me, Dad, I don't often understand all the things you say to me. Given me and given him, he's very bright, uh, but given me, that's perfectly understandable. But he said, I think I get this, that the only way to grow is up. <laughs> <laughs> now need leaders who in themselves have worked through their own personal growth. They've worked through the liberation of themselves if they're female uh, from being just a modern female, but if they're male, they've worked through the liberation of no longer being a modern male. That they've learned to integrate the right hemisphere of their brain into their left and their heart and body into both of that and their spirit. And so they've been on a personal journey of redemption and transformation. Because anybody who hasn't been on that journey in today's confusion, it is far too tempting for them to simply take a fascist way out because you can become the center of attention. It's what all adolescents want. You see it in Pierre Polyev, you see it in Danielle Smith, that they can behave in ways that there's only one spotlight and it's on them and they suck up all the oxygen in the room, not because they're so brilliant and deserve attention, but because this is the role they're playing. And those kind of people can only deepen the trauma. We need people now who are deeply mature and, and we, we don't have it. If you look at our universities, they're no longer in the business of forming character in spite of all their blather about leadership. They're selling yesterday's cosmopolitan understanding of reality, which is already outdated. And so in that sense, yes, we are in very deep trouble. I think we have some sense of the quality of leadership we need. Um, and for those of you working on the Club of Rome project about well-being, uh, whatever advice I would give, I've just given it. <laughs> well, we're seeking nirvana, Ruben. <laughs> I have a couple of questions from Paul Beckwith. Are you still here, Paul? Because they're good questions and I'd like to see them on. And then we'll go on to, to Samarat. Oh, okay, Paul has left. So Paul has Samarat. left. Well, I would like to see them asked anyway. First, uh, they can go together. Uh, but uh, can you comment on the climate war room that the Alberta government set up to trash anybody against the tar sands and oil sands. And his second question is, uh, will, uh, given the huge Fort McMurray fire and the current ones, will Alberta ever recognize that climate change exists? Um, the latter quickly, the premier uh, just literally in the last few months has publicly acknowledged that climate change exists She's now singing the same song the oil companies sing because they realize denial no longer works. And therefore, yes, it exists, but in order to cope with it, we have to decarbonize energy and therefore uh, the public purse will be uh, accessed to cover most of the infrastructure that will let the oil and gas business go on forever and make outrageous sums of money because we have built them the new infrastructure that will decarbonize the world. So that's the song she's singing. And of course, it's the song the oil and gas business sing. Um, as for the first question, so, so the issue of does, is it real, does it exist, is no longer on the table in Alberta, other than in some circles where they just haven't got the message yet, but, but they're so minor, they don't matter. As for the first one I actually talked about, the, the, the war room, I just didn't use the language, it is now named the Canadian Energy Center. That's okay. the old war room that was set up. The, the premier's language was, we're going to have a war room. He used that language to defend the oil industry. Uh, they have bought into this swill that it's ethical oil, uh, where other oil in the world isn't, and we're virtuous. Uh, I mean, again, the adolescent nature of the emotionally adolescent stance 
of so much leadership in Alberta is really important to notice because it maps on to what modernity wants of us. Modernity does not want us to become fully mature persons because then we have the capacity to become independent of modernity. We're no, it no longer owns us. And if it doesn't own us, we can move on beyond it. Thank you very much. Uh, Samrat, you're next. And following that is Claude Butner. Samrat, you have two questions there. You please proceed with both. I have one, just one. Yeah. But yeah, I want to thank you so much. The, the presentation is amazing to get to know about a part of Canada, which personally I don't know anything I, I didn't know about. Yeah. My question to you is uh, about the first slide that you presented. It says that Alberta got colonized or let's say became a part of Canada or uh, it became a part of the European uh, colonization quite late. Yeah. So the natives are still left there. Do they uh, participate in the democracy? What's their role? Just well, wonder, wonderful question. <clears throat> when Europeans first arrived here, um, of course, the Americas were settled with indigenous people. And uh, because, our, because of our attitudes and understanding, our assumed superiority and our weaponry, I'm sure you know the story of the way they were uh, both killed and uh, oppressed. And in Canada, we created reserves for them. That was true in Alberta as well. Um, and um, for much of Canada, not all of it, but much of Canada, not BC, not even large chunks of Ontario, but much of Canada, uh, their treaties have been signed between the dominant indigenous bands in a territory. And so Southern Alberta is Treaty 7, Southern Alberta and some of Southern Saskatchewan. It's, it was mostly Cree country with some uh, Sioux who had been driven here uh, more recently, I mean, by more recently, that's still hundreds of years ago, um, out of the U.S., uh, because the Sioux were typically, the Cree were south of the 49th parallel, but the, the Sioux uh, were, not, were not as common in Western Canada, they were in Eastern Canada. Mm -hmm. So, uh, only my sense of our relationship with Indigenous people is that uh, 2022, last year, was the first year that there was serious evidence that European Canadians, that's all the rest of us, whether you're from China, wherever you're from, just yeah. the rest of us, uh, 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 for the first time in our history, are beginning to understand what we have done and beginning to uh, learn to see these people as people to whom we have done great harm and to learn to just be on a journey towards truth and reconciliation. This will be a journey that takes generations, but that we're now on that journey. The United Church of Canada apologized to indigenous people in 1986. They were the first national institution of any kind to apologize to indigenous people. The next apology did not come for some years, almost a decade. Okay. And the United Church isn't important enough to sway the country. There was a day it was. In the 1930s and 40s, the United Church was a major force in Canada. It no longer is. Okay, so just one, one thing to just uh, trail it off. So uh, did such apologies make them come forward and participate in democracy? Well, they only received the right to vote okay. in 1960 by John Diefenbaker, a conservative uh, prime minister. Okay. Uh, they couldn't even vote before then. They weren't even seen as citizens of Canada. They were, they, I mean, Canada was here and European based and, and there were citizens, but these people who we had just moved in on weren't citizens enough to even vote. To this day, many indigenous people uh, so distrust the rest of us because uh, they've only been abused. Uh, and the stories of their families are stories of abuse. Uh, that they do not vote. Uh, the Stony Nakoda are my neighbors. They're the closest people down the road. Um, and I know some of them. And uh, no provincial politician tends to go to, um, to uh, what, we, what we legally call reserves to, to uh, indigenous lands that they live on 
because so few of them vote. And to get elected, it's numbers of votes that count. And in an election campaign, when time is limited, you invest your time getting as many votes as you can, and there just aren't enough. It, it doesn't mean, I mean, it's, it more, uh, uh, the Stony Nakoda Reserve has almost 5,000 people, but there, are, there aren't enough people who vote to make a difference. Okay, thanks so much. An amazing presentation again. Yeah. It, uh, the question you raise is really important because this has been a blind spot for us that we're beginning to deal with. And for, for those of us who are Caucasian Europeans, uh, this is only emotional difficulty uh, and apo abject apology for the rest of our lives. Okay. Thank you very Thank you so much. much. Claude, you're next and then um, Bill Reese. Yes, uh, to a certain extent, Ruben, thank you so much. Uh, it's very insightful. As an American, I have to admit that I'm pretty ignorant of Canadian politics and even history. So it was very enlightening. Um, my question actually was before you addressed Trumpism. So basically, I was hearing that dog whistle. It's like, boy, does that sound like Western states, you know, stay out of our a domain here and states rights. We don't want Washington to tell us what to do. So um, you sort of answered that, but I'll I'll invite you to be more explicit. Do you think that there's some um, some influence the Trumpers within the, the United States that are fomenting or helping along uh, like-minded people in Alberta? Uh, and then I'm going to add a little um, supplement to that. Uh, if this weakens Canada. Who does that help? Well, to answer your latter question first, the folks, I think it does weaken Canada. And I think the folks it helps are a, a subset of the elites that are already in Alberta. Uh, if, you, if you know the work of, God bless me, I've just forgotten his, he's just written a new book. Somebody here will know it. The guy who talks about a surplus of elites as one of the destabilizing factors. Bill, help me. Can't help you. What? You can't, he said. Can't. Okay. <laughs> well, normally, Bill can help me with it. He knows more than any other person I know uh, when it comes just to this. The, uh, anyway, he's an American scholar and has a very sophisticated theory of societal disintegration. And one of those, one of the, the main features is not only inequality, which lots of people talk about, but surplus elites. And so if you get Alberta of my generation, okay, I'm now in my 80s. So my generation, 6% of Canadians my age went to university, only 6%. So this is very much an elite activity. And for many of them, they were the first person in their family to go to university. Now, university educated people, just because of the demographics and whatnot, did very well. And so they sent most of their people to university. And Canada was still growing, so there'd be room for their people, to, their children to grow. But by the time you get to the grandchildren of, so that I graduated from university in a world where there was very little competition for jobs. So there was always more jobs than there was of me. And for my children, a little bit like that if they were well university educated not so much if they weren't grandchildren not so much at all because there's so many grandchildren university educated now that lots of companies are giving up making university education even a requirement for jobs so what you see are people who want to keep the elite status that they've had that they earned and if you're in alberta and and somehow you did a geology degree and you came here you may be worth now uh, at least hundreds of millions. That's kind of the least that you'll be worth. Um, and some of them are, I mean, there we probably have more billionaires per capita than any other place in Canada. Um, folks have done extraordinarily well because oil and gas is a high cash flow industry. So the folks it's helping are the very folks who have a vested interest in stirring things up. Now, to your, your first question was about Trump. You need to know that Southern Alberta is the part of Canada that is, in a sense, has been most Americanized. And that started with cattle, 
because you can't drive cattle from Eastern Ontario. There are lots of cattle in Eastern Ontario. There were no cattle drives in the 1880s from Glengarry County in Ontario to uh, Alberta. There were cattle drives in Texas, from Oklahoma, from Colorado, from Wyoming, uh, up to Alberta. So the early herds uh, came uh, overwhelmingly, not entirely. Um, some from Winnipeg, and those had come largely through uh, Minnesota. Uh, so what you've got is southern Alberta. When we look south, we literally see cousins, because remember, a million of the three million people who settled the prairies from 1890 to 1911 came from the U.S. So when we look south, we see family. We're the part of the U.S. that also is the Sun Belt and is the part that is most about states' rights because it opened last, it opened after the Civil War by and large. And they're the part of the U.S. that would be quite happy if you could saw the continent in two and let Central and let, let let what you call the Middle West and and Eastern and the Northeast and and even the Southeast just drift off into the Atlantic. Uh, nobody in Arizona would get upset. Nobody in BC or in Alberta would get upset if we could kind of saw off somewhere between here and Brandon. Well, we're not sure about Winnipeg. Winnipeg is never quite sure if it's the last outpost of Eastern Canada in the West or if it's the first really Western country. And, and so you see Manitoba always as a middle negotiator. It's the child in the family that keeps people talking. So uh, there's the, the Conservative Party in Canada has long ties with the Republicans and the Liberal Party long ties with the Democrats. At a national convention, there's always invite some of the other to come up and speak. Um, and so, yes, there are lots of ties. Uh, and as the Republican Party has become more Trumpian, the Canadian conservatives have moved it. But it's not just because of Trump. This is this goes back, and I, I'll finish the history. But but you know, there's a history out of Alberta. Preston Manning, the son of one of our premiers, good God-fearing fundamentalist Christian, but he and his dad always wanted to turn Alberta into a bastion of fundamentalist Christianity and capitalism. And the two for them went together. And, um, and so the seeds in Alberta, to some extent, come from the US. Yes, we're open to them. But fundamentally, the damage we're doing to ourselves is homegrown. Thank you very Thank you. much. Thank you. Bill, your turn. Another Western. There we go. Ruben, <laughs> you remind me of a boiling pot of water. And instead of turning it down, all the questions just turn up the heat. You, you've got so much to share that it, it just bubbles over. And I'm afraid to ask any question that might trigger you off in yet another direction. It was just a delight to hear you uh, pull all, all of that together. My big regret is that you're not giving us an hour presentation on this national news in the evening and uh, letting the rest of the country know what, what's really going on. But I have some queries. It seems to me the problem you're describing is the juvenilization of uh, adults across the world. We're, we're seeing much the same thing happening in, in the UK, in uh, well, Russia, for crying out loud. Uh, obviously, the United States is a, a center point in this sort of thing. So we seem to have lost our capacity to be adult humans in the face of complexity. So my original question before I heard most of your address was, the world is becoming increasingly complex. Is it even theoretically possible for leadership to match, which means successfully manage that complexity, given that we still basically have paleolithic, basically stone brains and minds. We, we tend to think in simplistic terms, uh, simple cause effect, uh, cause effect and mechanical relationships. And everything you described just screams of that. It's yep. simplistic, it's utterly trivial and, and shallow in every sense. You've given us a, a deep analysis that shows there's something underneath all of this, but most people just don't penetrate the surface. So I'm concerned. And by the way, was it Joseph Tainter that you were thinking of? Because he talks about the it's Joseph Tainter. No, no, it's not Joseph Tainter. It's he would have done because it seems to me we're 
looking at one of these great cycles of civilization in which we see the transition from a period of optimism and growth and, and, and essentially integrity toward a corruption at the top, um, disenchantment of the people with the leadership, uh, increasing income gaps, all of the things that lead to, in fact, crisis, collapse, civil war, as, as, as you're talking about. Anyway, go back to my original question. Do we have a hope of pulling out of this? Uh, is the, locally or locally? <laughs> if you, uh, my answer to that is uh, there is a, a, a slim chance, but even that hope lies the other side of despair. In other words, coming to terms with our actual situation globally, uh, it seems to me if it, it will induce despair to, to understand how deep the trouble is and that most of the kinds of things we're talking about and investing in now, such as the new uh, plan that was released yesterday to uh, adaptation, national adaptation plan, um, it's not that it's bad, it's just mostly irrelevant. It yes. would have been appropriate 40 years ago. Uh, today, it, it's closer to a joke uh, in the sense that real people think that real differences can be made in time to, quote, save us. And there isn't a ghost of a chance of that happening. So that it, in that sense, I despair, as you do, that our governing institutions and the cultures they're now part of, there seems to be very little chance that the kinds of people who are wrestling with these things could come to have enough influence to advise a government that would be able to understand it and have the courage and ability to act. Because most of the advice that is given is still advice to improve and protect the modern techno-industrial capitalist world that we've got. And what people need to come to terms with, again, this takes me beyond Alberta, but, but that world back to the foundations are, are eroding, uh, they are collapsing. Uh, so you make the scientific case that there is no future for modernity because of what we're doing to the biosphere, I make the case as one studied in the humanities that there is no future for modernity. And I don't have to get into your arguments. I, it's not that I disagree, we know each other well enough. I agree with you and I admire you, but there's a sense in which I don't need your arguments. I can make a case about the disintegration of modernity without any reference to climate change or any of those kinds of things because of the kinds of understandings that decent people in the humanities have about human consciousness and cultures. And it turns out if you put the two together, you end up slapping your head and saying, what chance have we? And, and I quite agree. Um, Thanks, guys. It sounds like piling on, actually. <laughs> and our next speaker is Raymond Lurie, followed by Peter Balkowski. Thank you very much, Raymond. <laughs> uh, thanks. A great Great presentation, Ruben. Always enlightening to uh, understand a bit more what other people think. Um, so, um, my question is: is uh, I, I've seen a few movements lately. Uh, one of them has been if you look at the climate change thing, right? If you and you look at the oil industry, uh, they start off by saying, "No, no, no, it's not real." Then they said, oh, "Well, it's real, but it's not caused by humans." And then it's, oh, "No, it's uh, okay. It's caused by humans, but we still need oil, oil and gas." And they're sort of like moving along the line, right? And I just saw the same thing happen in the uh, the hydrogen um, industry, where actually the oil and gas sector has been pushing very, very hard for hydrogen because they realize that the lowest cost hydrogen hydrogen is made with methane natural gas so that's a good market for uh for their products right uh but 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 uh th that industry seems to seems to be realizing that uh, uh hydrogen is not a good solution for transport and all that and don't don't want to get into a rat hole on that but it seems to be dawning on them that you know the numbers don't add up and all that right so given that uh, given that what we're seeing with uh, with uh, you know in a short, shorter term, uh, you know, next five or ten years, 
a, a, a pretty, what I believe will be a pretty radical and pretty rapid decarbonization of things like the transportation system. I expect we'll see a, a reduction in, in oil demand. And given that the oil and gas uh, produced from the, the tar sands in particular is among the wor the well the worst in terms of greenhouse gases, but correspondingly the most expensive to produce. Right, uh, I'm expecting that uh, the market for those uh, products will dry up very fast within the five five. Uh, five to, to 10 next years, I, I, you know, I believe that most of the, uh, maybe maybe a bit uh, too optimistic here, but <laughs> I believe that most of the uh, tar sands will, uh, will shut down because they won't be profitable. Now that's going to have a major impact on Alberta and whether it happens within five or 10 years or, or 20 years, it's going to happen. Um, so is there a way to, do you see a path to, to show Albertans that this, this hyper dependency they have on fossil fuels is is a real problem and they need to move away from that right so when and you, when you talk to public people you look at public opinion surveys a lot of albertans understand that climate change is real and all that and understand that they have to get off of this uh, this train but there doesn't seem to be certainly at the provincial level any effort to uh, to accelerate that and to to uh, you know so, sort of jump off the sinking ship and onto something that's likely to give them a better future right no, the the uh, the image that you've painted, uh, 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 there the at the moment, the elites in Alberta are getting their wagons in a circle to defend the oil and gas industry. The, it it presents it, it provides the government of Alberta uh, with about twenty seven percent of its income, and if you think of a any play any company any organization all of a sudden missing 27% of its income, the odds are it collapses. Mm -hmm. that, that, that that's, it's past a critical mass. And, and so the, the thought of serious adaptation in the language that you're talking about uh, is, is not on, it doesn't mean there aren't Albertans who think about those things, but then I'm back to the point that the folks who resist it are organized and, and have staff and have organizations, whereas the folks who uh, would agree with you are not organized. They have copy together and write the odd letter to the editor. Um, and it's harder for them to get op-ed pieces in the Calgary Herald and the Edmonton Journal because the Herald and the Journal are, are part of the elites. Um, so, so you've got a situation in which uh, don't expect Alberta at this point to be uh, to do anything that is very helpful. Uh, even the NDP um, uh, are only, uh, are, are, their position is very similar to the uh, UCP position in terms of content, but they're much more pleasant about it. They'll say, we'll work with you. They're, I mean, they're, they're in that sense, you know, we'll smile at you and we won't fight with you and, and all of that. But if you actually look at the content, uh, it, it's very much still in the space that we've become so dependent on it that we can't imagine a future without it. Thank you, Ruben. We'll work with you as long as you're not liberal, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I have three more, uh, time for three more pre uh, questions. They will be from Jeff Passmore, from uh, from Anitra Thorhog and from Jean and Dave Doherty. So that's the, then we will close it off and we can all yell at each other. Oh, good. <laughs> so over to you, Jeff. Well, thanks very much, uh, Ted. And uh, actually uh, there's all kinds of things I would like to comment on and say, but I just wondered, Ruben, if you're speaking to Rotary clubs or you know other service clubs, uh, in Edmonton and Calgary or Red Deer or wherever you want to go in Alberta and delivering this message and what kind of a reaction do you get? Um, COVID, of course, uh, shut down a lot of that stuff. It, it's now back up again. Um, and um, uh, I have disappeared largely from the radar in Alberta. There was a time I was on it fairly securely uh, but to maintain that position, you have to be seen not just in Calgary, but in the rest of the province. And, and COVID um, 
altered that, plus the fact that it happened at it. I mean, given my own age, I'm 84. Uh, uh, I, I'm not. Uh, I'm not in the same kind of business I was when I was 50 and came back to Alberta. Um, so yes, I've talked to the odd Rotary Club. The last one I talked to, I knew the president and told him what I was going to do. And we've been friends for decades and, and colleagues. And he said, um, go for it. Uh, you know, I don't know how we'll respond, uh, but, but I want you to have a place where you can speak freely. And um, they, there was, you could see in the response that a small minority were quite interested uh, in the way that they were responding and body language and whatnot. Um, uh, uh, some of the younger women came up to me afterwards, one of them in tears saying, uh, it's the first speech I've ever heard in public that gives my generation some hope that there are people who understand what we face. Um, on the other hand, um, most people just filed out quietly the way you file out of a church where there's been a guest preacher that somehow didn't inspire you. Um, so uh, given the dominant tenor in the province, um, this is a hard conversation to have. Some of us are working on a strategy in relationship to Canmore that if it works and we'll have a better sense of even whether to work or not by late July. Um, and and then it'll take us a year or two to see the extent to which it'll work uh, to, to to develop a strategy that would allow a community to learn to have conversations about these things, but not in a partisan way in the sense of it it focuses on jobs and you know good good bad and whatever else um and i have no idea because it's a strategy that as far as i know hasn't been tried anywhere else uh, because i i take your question seriously how do you help a culture that is addicted to modernity and i use addicted seriously in that chemical sense it does things to your brain and physical body that is addicted to modernity come to understand that modernity has no future. And if you stay addicted to it, you simply die with it. Thank you very much, Ruben. Our next question comes from Anitra Thorhog. And our final question will come from Jean and or Dave Doherty, who are closet Albertans. So they may have something for you. <laughs> Both of them, if they, if they are arm wrestling now, for which of them will speak? <laughs> right. <laughs> um, in the beginning, the original concept of the Club of Rome was to be what I would call horse whisperers or people who would go to the to the leadership of the world and whisper in their ear all the wisdom that they could figure out by clustering together and talking about the world's important problems on an ongoing futures viewpoint. And you have just explained to us very clearly, and I thank you for your presentation, uh, about <clears throat> what pattern is going on, which is very much like the Norwegian pattern, except they've gone to the stage of all agreeing with climate change, but not doing anything in their practice, like they continue to pump as vigorously as they ever did and to sell overseas, but they don't use it themselves. So I'm wondering if you have solutions of what you would whisper into the ears of some willing leadership, either at the federal or at the fringes of the Albertan uh, hierarchy, who's really the mover and shaker behind these two ladies whose personalities you've given us a great deal about. What, where would you go? Where, where are the tipping points and where the fulcrum leveraging points as dana meadows would say and what would you whisper and, and i would agree with dana that uh the, the the most significant leverage point is around paradigm change uh and um so what i would whisper uh in alberta to uh, and in alberta it would only 
take two or three. I mean, there are people well healed enough that that if they were really serious about it, uh, it wouldn't take them probably more than a month to raise a billion dollars. Um, as as I look at things now in as integrated a way as I can, I do not find any institution in the world dedicated to understanding the evolution of our species through what I call transitions of forms of civilization. So I treat being indigenous as a form of civilization. It's, a fo it's the original form. Um, there was a time that everybody on the planet was indigenous no matter where they were. You go back 15,000 years to be safe uh, and, and, and then for 300,000 years before that. Um, eventually, uh, another form of civilization emerged, not as conscious choice it, over millennia, literally and unconsciously, but, but eventually people found themselves living in settled agriculture-based regions and even empires that are fundamentally so different from an indigenous form that they could recognize that, that this isn't just a different way of being indigenous. This is a different thing from being indigenous, not good, bad, but it implies that the reality we're part of is ambiguous enough that you can, you can interpret it in at least two different ways and make a go of it. And more recently, we've added a third way to that, namely our modern way. What we're lacking, I think, is an understanding of those transitions because we're now in the transition from modernity and the part of the transition that is most obvious is the disintegration of modernity. That's more obvious, there's more research on it, there's more people talking about it. I mean, it's still marginal and uh, uh, as, as you and most people on this call know, but compared to the research that in a more positive sense says, what do we actually know about the process and dynamics uh, of a new form of civilization emerging? And how does that happen at different scales? What are the kinds of processes that are deeply personal and that are in small groups, whether they're families or whatever, and uh, at other scales? There's literally no institution in the world dedicated to that work as a center for research and practice. And there is a center that I would take over if I could, if I had a billion dollars, well, I'd need two, I'd need a billion dollars to buy it. And that's the Banff Center of the Arts, which at the moment is, uh, has an extraordinary record since the 1930s in working with the arts and a more recent record for 30 years of working with indigenous wisdom, uh, both of which are gonna be critical to the work I see that needs to be done. So we could say to the government of Alberta, you see it as a cost center, we'll take it off your hands and save you that money. And we'll guarantee that the arts and the indigenous work will continue, but we're gonna add all kinds of dimensions that aren't there now, so that it becomes the world's first center of research and practice for personal to civilizational transcendence. And we both know there are lots of people mucking around kind of in that space, but they are not at all organized in a way that the research um, reinforces each other and uh, there are synergies together that are really significant. Um, so if, if I had just one shot at it, I'd buy the BAMP Center from the Alberta government. If you approach them properly, they would happily let you take it off their hands. It's a cost center to them and uh, turn it into a place because there are enough people around the world that, that you could uh, put together fairly rapidly uh, a, a, a staff the size, the Perimeter Institute for Theoretical Physics in Waterloo, which is now the premier place for theoretical physics in the world, is no longer Cambridge, uh, thinks that they need 250 professions, professionals and a ratio of three to one support staff for the place to function. So that's, uh, you know, you can't start there, but it's a model to work towards. My sense is the time is ripe for a really significant international effort. So the second billion I would want is to run the place for the, the first 10 years. 
Thanks, Ruben. I actually took environmental courses there. They used to have a pretty good environmental center. Does it still exist? No, the the leadership stuff. The it, it, it's uh, they haven't had a decent board of directors hmm. for forty years. Yeah. I mean, by decent, I mean people who can engage in this conversation. Yeah. I mean, put it another way, I don't know a university board in Canada that has the capacity to engage in this conversation, and that. Yeah. <laughs> You're just trying to make us feel good, Ruben. <laughs> I'm going to turn it over to Dave now for the last question, and then we'll thank the speaker and uh, let you guys go if you need to. Dave. Thanks. Um, yeah, Ruben, I'm going to have to watch it all again with great interest. Um, here's my question, and I'll, I'll try to make it a, a softball that you can hit out of the park. So I won't mention the um, the elephant in the room that would make it impossible to hit out of the park. Were Alberta to separate, would the federal lands, such as national parks and forces bases, remain part of Canada? Yes, and more than that. Let, let me tell you a story that's a Danielle Smith story. At the conference in, that I mentioned in January 2020, um, Daniel was one of the MCs of this day-long conference. And the pattern was the speaker would speak and then she would pull up a couple of comfy chairs and kind of have a bit of an interview with them. And after one of the uh, chiefs had spoken, and I've forgotten which one it was, um, it's in the file. Um, uh, and he had suggested that indigenous people would resist all this talk about sovereignty. He, he was quite sympathetic to liberation stories, but he figured that if Albertans wanted to be considered concerned about liberation, they should start with Indigenous people and then go from there, not with themselves. And, and so Danielle literally said to him, well, what difference does it make to you if the government you're dealing with is in Edmonton as opposed to Ottawa? I mean, if you know anything about Indigenous people and the relationship to the Crown and the honour of the Crown, and all of that, I mean, this is a question that's so ignorant that you don't know where to start. And he just looked at her and said, well, when you go, Alberta is going to look as if it has measles, because none of the indigenous land is going with you. And we are scattered all over the place from Hay River down to Milk River, and we're not going. And she was literally shocked. And this was news to her, and it was a degree of ignorance that you know, is, is and was appalling now that she's premier, because the strategy that Alberta has used with Indigenous people is to discover that teaching Indigenous people to get into business is actually a more effective process of taking the Indian out of the child than Indigenous schools, because now they have to learn about ownership in cultures that didn't ever talk about ownership, not just of the land, but of other things, that, that ownership in the sense it's mine and not yours, respect in the sense of this story belongs to that family. But that's respect, not ownership. A particular dance belongs to this dancer and not to you. It's disrespectful for you to dance it. That's understood. But ownership and profit and cash value, um, not and uh, Alberta puts uh, more than a billion dollars a year into that. And I suspect it is a conscious uh, effort behind the scenes. Ted Morton is on the record that um, we should do everything we can to uh, enculturate Indigenous people into modernity and just get over this nonsense of a separate people. Reminds me of... Uh... An urban myth, I guess you could call it, that when uh, Quebec was threatening to separate, one of their indigenous leaders said, well, you can go ahead and separate. That's fine. As long as you go away with what you brought, a couple of little ships. Yeah, the other thing they did was they simply said the only land ceded to the Quebecois uh, was very tiny anyway. They wanted about, eight, they were saying 80% of it's going to stay with whatever's left. <laughs> so, yes, it's very strong power. I'm going to ask Jean, is Jean available online now? She was going to 
There she comes. She's yeah. going to thank you formally, Ruben, and you deserve it. <laughs> uh, yes, Ruben, I, again, as uh, chairman of the KCOR Board of Directors, it is indeed my pleasure to thank you for another superb presentation. And as a native born Albertan, and one who has been gone for the times that you've been back there, um, I am very happy to hear the stuff that you've been saying because it answers so many questions that I've had about why the people that I knew and loved have, have gone so strange. It is difficult for me to go back to Alberta and try and talk to some of my friends and colleagues because they just don't get the fact that they've been brainwashed. So anyway, I just want to say thank you so much for an absolutely fantastic presentation that you gave today. So thank you. Jean, I admire the way you lead KCOR and to hear your praise uh, touches me and I am thankful. Thank now, you. Everybody, and we're going to let you all off. You can all come back <laughs> online with your, with your mics and talk to each other. Uh, we are turning the, uh, I hope, Art, we are turning off the. I'm not quite finished, Ted. <laughs> are, okay, keep going. Keep all going. Right. Sorry. <laughs> so, for those of you who are still here, I would encourage you to look at the CanadianCore.com, our website. If you log in and stay with the Stay Informed group, you will see this presentation, the link when it goes up later on today or tomorrow, and the links to all of the other presentations that we've had. I would also um, like you to take a look at our organization. If you're interested in becoming part of our organization, you have information about membership, as well as other things that um, are of interest to you, a lot of information on the website. So CanadianCore.com should be your place to go. Thank you very much. Thanks again, everybody.